there's a poem by Suli Brakes, why I hate school but love education. And that sums me up, man. Like I hate the traditional school system in that it teaches you to avoid failure at all costs. Everything that Book Thinkers is today is a result of every failure I've made. The business itself has probably failed nine or 10 times. But because I didn't jump too early, I'm standing here today with a business that will cross seven figures in total revenue by the end of this year. This week, I'm honored to be joined by podcast host, founder of Book Thinkers, and now author of his new book, Rise of the Reader. Nick Hutchison. Kevin Horsley, he gave you such amazing advice. And he told you it's better to operate from a place of certainty. If I had decided not to take Kevin's advice, we wouldn't be on this podcast today. Book thinkers would have failed. It would have required too much money. And I would have had to have dropped book thinkers and gone back into some type of full-time job. Now I wouldn't have a book and I wouldn't be talking to Grant and all these people, but I am. And it's because I didn't risk too much up front. What's my intention for the business? From a personal perspective, I'd like to continue to prioritize personal flexibility and impact over profit. I don't want you to say what your intention is for the book, but is there one central core theme that you think people might overlook? Yes. The importance of... I want to transition this to another facet of your life that recently happened, and it starts... Yeah, it's a great question that nobody's asked me about before on a podcast. Let's start in one of everyone's favorite places from their childhood, uh, high school Spanish class. <laughs> so you had quite the experience in your own high school Spanish class where you're doing the normal presenting in front of the class and you have a bowl of popcorn in front of you and you end up dropping that bowl around the floor. And one of the more embarrassing experiences, <laughs> if I had to guess, and I'm sure everyone listening has a similar type of experience, but I want to talk more about that growth that you've had to go from that point to the point you are now where you're in front of thousands of people producing a podcast where you're talking to some of the biggest business leaders in the world, and you're doing live public speaking events. I know we're going to talk all about learning today and how to be the best learner that you can while being the best reader, but I want to start with unlearning. So what do you think you had to unlearn from that time when you were in high school to become the version of yourself that you are now? Tom, it's a great way to kick off the podcast, man. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm in Spanish class. I've memorized this presentation. I know it backwards, forwards, left, right, up, down, English, Spanish, like I know this thing. <laughs> and uh, the public speaking fears that I had, the social anxiety took over and I froze and I got embarrassed. And the teacher actually said to me, hey, like, do you want your cheat sheet? Like, do you want the card? And I couldn't even <laughs> verbalize, yes, please give it to me. <laughs> and I dropped the bowl of popcorn. It goes everywhere. I'm super insecure, embarrassed, nervous, whatever. I just leave the classroom. Right. So that is who I used to be uh, to paint a little bit more of that picture. And all of the things that you've mentioned, those are characteristics of who I am now. So your question, I think, was kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? I didn't just wake up magically, read one book, take a pill and have the ability to effectively communicate. But it they say your purpose comes from your pain. I experienced a lot of pain in my ability or lack thereof to communicate effectively. And so I went on a mission to solve that problem. It didn't really come until early college where I was faced with an opportunity to start practicing my communication. I took an internship with a company called Collegiate Entrepreneurs, where they would teach you how to run your own house painting business. And I think that I skipped the part <laughs> where I would have to do all my own door-to-door -door sales. And so I was just worried about getting hired. They said you could make like five figures, $10,000 plus as a summer intern. I'm like, okay, like let's go make this happen. <laughs> and very early into that experience between my freshman and sophomore years of college, I was out there every single day, door-to-door -door selling. First time I knocked on a door, I had the sort of like the territory manager with me, yeah. kind of behind me for support. And I had this entire script memorized and, you know, Hey, my name's Nick. I'm a local college student, blah, blah, blah. But I knock on the door and this woman answers and I just said, Hey, would you like an estimate? And she's like, who are you? And an estimate for what? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I forgot the whole thing. And I just turned around and looked at him all nervous and he stepped in and helped me out. Like that's how bad I was. I cannot understate how poor of a communicator I really was. And so what did I do to improve it? Door-to-door -door sales. I started taking some public speaking classes in college. I started to volunteer as the presenter in group projects. I started to embrace discomfort. Yeah. 
after college, I, well, even my, my, the end of my college experience, I had a phone sales position. Then I was good enough at that, that I would fly around and attend conferences, work at booths for the company that I was working for, meeting people all day, every day. I joined Toastmasters. So that's a, an organization where you can practice your public speaking. Yeah. And I started creating content for social media. And at first, almost nobody was watching. And as the eyeball, eyeballs started to roll in, I would pay more attention to how I was articulating things, vocal inflection, all of these characteristics of a voice. Yeah. And then eventually I started producing a podcast. So that's a long rant, Tom. I hope your audience is still with us. But the moral <laughs> of the story is that I didn't really get outside of my comfort zone all too much. I just continued to expand from the place that I was in. And I think sometimes when you get outside of your comfort zone too much, too far, too fast, you can break. Kind of picture a rubber band. Yeah. As you slowly expand it, it could snap if you pull it too fast. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people who say, hey, I want to learn how to communicate more effectively. They take a jump. They're embarrassed. They kind of go back, hide in a corner and they give up. So yeah, yeah, man, it's been a lot. I've read books, I've watched videos, tutorials, courses, like I could go on forever about it. Yeah. First of all, I love long rants. I say that all the time. And the second thing I love okay, talking good. about is having, I don't want to call it realistic time horizons, but having this understanding of what time horizons should look like. Exactly that uh, analogy that you were giving. If you try to stretch a rubber band real quick, it's going to break. And the same thing when it comes to trying to start your own business, trying to go out on your own and do something. If you give it 90 days and you say, that's my timetable, you're going to break pretty quick if you don't see the results that you're looking for. When we talk about your journey, like you said, you're <laughs> going out in college, going door to door. You're taking a job. At, was it transportation software is what I read? Like yes. doing, doing something that a lot of people normally wouldn't get into, but you're taking that job, you're building communication skills. And at that time when you're in your internship, you get introduced to podcasting. Your coworker gives you the name Book Thinkers and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Now I'm going to try to start building this business while I'm doing this. In addition to it, like we said right before this podcast, you have the nine to five and the five to nine. It's not overnight. And now you're at this point in your journey where you're able to write a book and you can share everything that you've learned with the people. And it's awesome. And the book is structured around three steps in the framework, how I've taken it. And the first step that I want to focus on is the note-taking aspect of that framework. If you want to find yourself successful when it comes to reading, if you want to find yourself successful when it comes to business, you have to take effective notes to make sure that you're really focusing on what you're learning and you're implementing it. And that's going to be the next step of the framework, but let's focus on note-taking first. So when you're note-taking on your own personal journey throughout business, is there actually any note-taking going on at this point in your life when you're in early college transitioning out into your software sales job? Are you journaling? Are you really reflecting on what's going on in your day-to-day -to, -day to see, okay, here's how I reacted to certain factors throughout the day. And here's what kind of action I could take to make sure that I either improve upon or remove something from my life that's not helping me. What was very unique about the software that I was selling was that whenever I would sell a software package to a company, it was B2B sales, they mm -hmm. would have to go through an implementation period. So the software wasn't turnkey. You couldn't just start using it the next day. You had to go through a series of training sessions. You had to practice those training sessions, come back, ask questions, reflect, make revisions, continue to implement. And that soft, I mean, that implementation period could take anywhere between a few weeks to a few months, depending on the size of the company. Yeah. And so when I started reading these books, I think what happened in hindsight was that I started to apply that framework to the books that I was reading. I just naturally went through an implementation period where I would go back and review the notes that I was taking from these books. So from book number one, I think I was taking notes or at least highlighting from the books that I was reading. And I remember... Let's see, this was going into my senior year. So sometime in that first summer, I took my first attempt at reading Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I remember I highlighted well over 100 different items from that book. And so I was trying to build a retention system that early in my process because very quickly I was realizing that as I was reading more books, the newer books were coming in. I would have a recency bias of memory towards what I had just recently read. And I started to forget, you know, the other things that I was reading. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I was concerned about it very early on. And I think the reason that I went through an implementation period like that with the books that I was reading and really tried to implement things, reflect on them and take effective notes is because of the software that I was selling. Yeah. 
And I remember as a recent graduate on a business trip to Chicago with Kyle, the guy that introduced me to podcasting. And I remember having a drink with Kyle at the bar and telling him about all the books I was reading, the things that I was implementing. And I remember him stopping me and saying something like, you know, it probably changes over time with memory, but Mm. something like, hey, Nick, not many people your age are reading personal development and business books. Of those that are, not many are actually taking notes. And of the ones that take notes, not many actually go back and reflect on these notes and try to actively implement them, sort of transform information into action. And Kyle was my mentor at the time, man. I wanted to be just like him. And so to hear that from him, it was validating that I was on the right path and so that I should do more of that and less of everything else. And so, yeah, I was taking notes. I was highlighting. I mean, and I can't really remember exactly what format that happened in back then, but I was even rewriting the notes that I was taking onto a website, which was the first iteration of bookthinkers.com. It was really just my notes from the books that I was reading. So yeah, to answer, I think your question was, did you take notes? I think I did take notes. <laughs> yeah. Again, I love the answer. Uh, and I, I love the advice that you got at that point in your life, because I think something that holds young people back, especially is that we're operating from a point of such uncertainty in the framework of our own life where we have no idea what direction we want to take our life. We haven't defined the vision for ourselves as to where we want our life to go. And even if you were to hand someone a self-help book at that point in our lives, they might read it, like you said, and even they might take notes. But when it comes to implementing, if they got five other things going on and they have all these voices in their head saying like, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, pulling at their attention, they're not going to be able to implement effectively. And Speaking of another mentor of yours in Kevin Horsley, he gave you such amazing advice, which I loved when you were asking him about, you know, should I take book thinkers full time or should I stay where I am right now? And he told you it's better to operate from a place of certainty so that you can have the most effective results. And I think that's very true when it comes to being able to shift from the note taking phase to the implementation phase, that if you can't operate from a place of certainty, you're not going to be able to effectively implement do you think that was true when it came to book thinkers that maybe you're taking notes on what's going on in the business, what's going on in your personal life? And because you had that certainty in your life with the software job, you were able to effectively implement better than you would if had you gone all in. Yeah, 10,000%. In Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth Revisited, he says something like 95% of small businesses fail in the first five years. Yeah. And most of those businesses fail because they can't afford to continue trying out whatever they're trying. And the only reason that I could continue to fail at book thinkers related projects and monetization schemes and frameworks and things like that is because I had a great job. And that job was teaching me skills as far as sales and communication and organization and how a small business works. That job was teaching me things that I was directly applying to book thinkers as well. Yeah. Everybody at that software job profit tools. They were all aware of book thinkers and my desire to start a business. So yeah, it was great to have that support system. And I, I sort of think about it like this. Book thinkers started in 2017 as a legally registered business. Mm-hmm. Here we are roughly seven years later, six and a half years later, whatever the time is. And the business itself has probably failed nine or 10 times. It really has. <laughs> I have had nine or 10 failed attempts at growing a business. But because I didn't jump too early, I'm standing here today with a business that will cross seven figures in total revenue by the end of this year. How cool is that? But it's through all of those other iterations. So talk about timeline, which is something that you brought up in the beginning, Tom. Have a realistic expectation. I heard so many people tell me, Nick, it takes longer than you think. And I just thought, okay, I'm cocky. I've got an ego. I can defy all odds. I'm a know-it-all. Well, I wasn't. And I failed nine or 10 times in a row. But because Kevin gave me that advice, I didn't jump too early. And so Gary Vee says this all the time. If you can find a full-time job that teaches you something that you can apply to your side hustle or your passion, then at least you're getting something good other than money. You're building skills and relationships. And that was really important to me. If, and I'll just, I'll throw this out there. If I had decided not to take Kevin's advice, we wouldn't be on this podcast today because book thinkers would have failed. It would have required too much money. I didn't have a big nest egg and I would have had to have dropped book thinkers and gone back into some type of full-time job. 
and that would have stunk. Now I wouldn't have a book and I wouldn't be talking to Grant and all these people, yeah. but I am. And it's because I didn't risk too much up front. And I think another point that I want to touch upon and how I view how your success transpired is because you had that intention with you where you knew where you wanted to take book thinkers and you could fail nine, 10 times where most people would give up after two. You said to yourself, okay, this is the point where a lot of people would have given up, but I'm not going to because I know what my intention is here. And something that I love that you've said before is that even when it comes to reading a book, the thing that takes books away from being in something that's a form of entertainment to being something that you're doing purposefully is you have an intention. When you open the book, you know, okay, what do I want to get out of it? And you would physically write on the cover of the book and you would say to yourself, this is what I want to get out of this book when I'm reading it. So if we were thinking about book thinkers, the business as a book, what would you write on the cover of book thinkers to say, this is my intention for the business and this is what I want to get out of the experience? It's a great question. I don't know because I've never thought about about it through this lens. I mean, it makes total sense what you're asking. Mm -hmm. It'll take me a minute to work through it in my yeah, head. Take your time. So I believe a great intention follows the SMART goal framework. So if you pick up a book like this, like I just decided to read this book today with somebody on my team. So I haven't decided on the intention yet, yeah. but this book is called Amplify Your Influence, Transform How You Communicate and Lead by Rene Rodriguez. The intention will probably be something like, I'm looking to find and implement at least two ways to improve my storytelling abilities by the end of next week yeah. or something like that. Because the ability to effectively communicate has created the success that I have today and I don't want to lose momentum on that. Yeah. And so that follows the SMART goal framework. S stands for specific. That's specific. I want to find and implement two things. It's measurable. I know whether or not I found and implemented two things by the end of next week. It's attainable for sure. I read a lot and I can implement two things by the end of next week. Yeah. Um, the R, I like to say it's written down somewhere. I know that's a little bit of a cheat code, but I like to say that it's written down somewhere and I have an activity tracking system that we could talk about later. And then T, is it time bound? Yes, it's bound by the end of next week. Mm -hmm. And if you add the word because, you add a little bit of flavor and emotion to your intention for each book, you're more likely to find and implement those two things because it's more meaningful to you. Yeah. The we could talk about intention a little bit more in a minute, but what's my intention for the business? Well, this year, my intention for book thinkers 2023 is to do at least 630,000 in revenue by the end of 2023. Uh, that, that is the overarching goal. And then from a personal perspective, I'd like to see if it matches the framework. <laughs> I'd like to continue to prioritize personal flexibility and impact over profit. Yeah. And I'd like to do that by making sure that at the end of every week, when I look back, I make sure I was not stressed out. I was not overcommitted that I go to the gym every day that I focus on my personal health, that I don't sacrifice any of those things, any relationships for the sake of business or profit. Yeah. And that I'm always trying to positively impact our customers and our community. Yeah. And I could package that a little bit better, but since you put me on the spot, I think it was a great <laughs> question. It It's a fun way to think about my intention for the business. I think it's prioritizing personal flexibility and impact over profit. Yeah. And I just need to work at maybe making those a little bit more measurable. Yeah. Well, from reading about your story, that's one of the things that I admire most about you is that you're not allowing the business to take total control of your life. You have made it so known that you value the flexibility for everyone that works with you, that works for you, and you want that type of lifestyle for everybody because you value it and you're not going to allow those values to be compromised in, in the pursuit of something that you necessarily don't want. And it's something that I heard you talk about when you were on your podcast with Alex Harmozy that you were able to focus on strategies to remove yourself from the business while at the same time increasing the revenue of the business, which I mean, win-win, it doesn't get much better than that. So I think just in terms of understanding implementation, I thought that would be a really good example to walk through. I know there's probably a numerous amounts of examples that you could walk through from the book and how you implement it into the business. But is there one that sticks out in particular that you read something on the page and you said to yourself, okay, I need to be intentional about this. I really need to absorb this knowledge and implement it into the business so I can better impact my own life and the life of everyone that I'm working with. 
Yeah, well, we can use Alex's book, $100 million offer. So the first time that I read that book, there's an exercise somewhere in the book where he's helping you build your value equation. Mm -hmm. And one of the variables in there has to do with what service are you providing? And so his promise to you is that 20% of your customers are willing to pay five times more than they currently are. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, like, I need to get out a whiteboard and I need to sketch every single way that I can solve my customers' problems and just think bigger, think better. Even if it's intimidating and I don't know how to fulfill that service yet, I've just got to sketch it out. Yeah. And he has some other examples in that book. I think he says, hey, Tom, for 60 seconds, journal about how you can sell a brick to other people. Yeah. And so you journal and you come up with some ideas. And then he says, oh, why well, think so limited? What if the bricks could come in any size? And you're like, oh, I didn't think they could be huge bricks. Now I've got a bunch of other ideas. Hey, Tom, why be so limited? What if they come in different colors and materials? And you're like, I didn't even think that they could be plastic and lightweight. And then you come up with all these other ideas. Yeah. So it's just a way to get out of your own way and start thinking about additional services. So here I am. I literally have these pictures. I had a whiteboard where I drew out every single problem that I think my ideal customer is facing around book promotion and marketing. Yeah. And I had heard this feedback from a lot of people over the years. They said, hey, Nick, it's great that we can rent space on your community. We can promote our books in front of the book thinkers audience, but help us build our own audience. And I thought, mm. you know, I know that has to be done through video content, but authors are uncomfortable on video. And it would be expensive to fly to authors, bring the camera equipment, you know, obviously we need to show up and be professional. So we need to script everything out from their book. I'm like, that's going to be expensive. Yeah. But I just said, let me throw it on the board. It was just one of many, many, many ideas that we didn't currently offer, but I thought maybe we should. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm sketching it out, I'm starting to get more excited about that. And I just kind of put a dollar value next to it. And I'm like, wow, that's five times bigger than my average deal size right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's realistically what I would have to charge for it. And so I reached out to the first author that came to mind, and he literally said to me, hey, Nick, I have that item as something that I wanted to touch base with you on. I have it written down. <laughs> I'm like, no way. And that was short form video production where we'd fly out and film with authors. Yeah. And so he negotiated me down. It, he was a guinea pig. He said, I know I'm a guinea. He's a smart guy, uh, business executive that has a few hundred employees and stuff. Uh, but we went out. We tried it out. It worked. I started selling it. And it I think Cormozzi at the time when I was quoted, he actually uses some book thinker stuff in one of his presentations. It forexed my revenue on a monthly basis almost immediately. And that was just because I went through the book, I followed the exercises, I implemented it directly into the business, and then I sold it once I figured out that it was successful for us and for our clients. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people, I think sometimes business owners get in their own ways because they're not exponentially curious like I am. Yeah. And, you know, every time I read a book, I'm humbled because there's something that I realize I don't know much about that other people are experts in. And uh, that's a shot at the ego. Yeah. You know, it's an entire world that you were unaware of previously, but now you know just a little bit. Yeah. And you know that you know that you know that you don't know a lot of it. So, yeah, yeah Hormozzi's the man. I'm so happy that he wrote that book. And, that he's got yeah. another one coming out. I was going to say he's got one coming out real soon. Um, I, I just want to go a little bit deeper on, you know, you mentioned that the executive that you were working with, he was your guinea pig kind of, and you're going through this process together, working mm -hmm. on what's going to be the best approach to make this deal happen. And I think something that a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people allowed them to not have them be successful is that they try to focus on having the perfect product before they pitch it out to somebody. They wait for the perfect timing before they jump in and they say, hey, I have something to offer you. And I think once that point is reached, they've already missed the window of opportunity that they should have been taking. So when it comes to, like you talked about with ego, making sure that you're doing something that's in the best interest of yourself and your business, how do you put any egotistical thoughts to your side saying like, I need this to be perfect before I launch this out there and say, I just need to jump in and there's a window of opportunity, even if it's going to be a bit messy. Well, the first time I read about the concept of an MVP, a minimally viable product was probably in... The Lean Startup by Eric Reese, really good business book. Could have been Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the concept of an MVP is that you put something out before it's done. And if you're not embarrassed, you've waited too long. Yeah. Okay. 
I remember Reed Hoffman talking about this in his book, Blitzscaling too. If you wait to the point that you're not embarrassed to put something out, you've waited too long because customer feedback is always going to be more accurate than the vision of, of how your customers can interact with something. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just, from reading these business books and learning about putting something out before you're ready so that you can collect feedback and make iterations instead of finishing something only to realize that it didn't have product to market fit, then have to go back and test something that was less secure anyway. It's yeah. like, you might as well do it, do it the first time. Yeah. So yeah, product market fit, man. I think I also learned that because the first I've had like nine or 10 attempts at monetizing book thinkers <laughs> that didn't work, including two different mobile applications that I paid, we paid yeah. to get finished and they didn't have product market fit. And that's because we made a bunch of assumptions, didn't test them before the product was finished. And as a result, we'd spent our money and it was done. Yeah. And so, yeah, I've learned the hard way too. Um, ego is tough, man. I, I had a, a really big, really intrusive ego that would represent itself at the expense of other people for all of my late teens and early 20s. And it's, uh, it's gotten me in trouble more than it's done me any good. Yeah. I, I've had kind of the opposite where I definitely, I, I've gotten to the point now where I'm confident, but I used to be so unconfident in my own, in my own skin where I wouldn't want to promote myself out there because of embarrassment, like you talked about in the beginning there, where I was embarrassed to share certain ideas. And I think when it comes to the last point of the framework with retention, something that is key to me when it comes to retention, even if it's in the classroom, now in the professional world, if I'm at work, if I'm doing this, it's asking the right questions about the material that you're being presented. Are you reading it, taking the notes, trying to implement it, but if there's something that you don't understand, are you asking the proper questions to make sure that you're implementing it correctly? And you find yourself in such a unique position where you get to read all these amazing books and then you get to interview the author afterwards. And you're kind of acting as the liaison between here's the person reading the book at home, here's you, and then here's the author. Maybe they have their questions at home and they're looking to you to see if you can ask those same questions for them. So my question to you based on your experience as a podcaster is, how do you go about formulating your questions to make sure that you're maximizing your understanding of the material while you're conversing with the author, while at the same time making sure that the audience understands the material as well? Yeah, it's a great question. In the beginning, I would read the entire book and I would start to apply the book into my own life. And whenever I would have struggles or something didn't seem to fit for me, that's how I would generate the questions for the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now at that time, I was not a great podcaster. And what I mean by that is there were a lot of errors in my communication, one of which was that I would follow the rubric or the set of questions that I had laid out to a T. Yeah. So somebody would say something really interesting. And instead of following my curiosity and asking follow-up questions, I would come up with some type of dumb transition and just go, okay, great. <laughs> on to the next question and then just look over to my other screen and read my other questions. Yep. And so although I had part of the process right, which was reading the book, understanding the material, attempting, attempting to implement it, coming back with feedback and questions, I would just follow that rubric. Yep. Now, I definitely follow my curiosity. I probably don't do as much prep as I used to. Mm -hmm. uh, there were periods of time as well where I would poll my audience. I'd say, hey, Robert Green's coming on to the podcast. I'm looking for everybody to suggest questions. If you've read The 48 Laws of Power, um, drop a comment down below. Yep. And uh, I would use some audience questions, you know, plus my experience and come up with some fun and unique stuff. Yeah. Something else that I do as a podcaster before I press record, I always ask my guests and I make the statement to make them feel good. I'll say something like this. Hey, Robert, I know you've done a thousand interviews on The 48 Laws of Power. What is something that every podcaster seems to miss that you want to talk about today? Yeah. And then he'll suggest something that is exciting to him or that he feels people are missing. Or I'll just say something like, uh, well, we can leave it at that. That's yeah. the basic question. How can we differentiate today's podcast from everything else that you've done? What is something that people typically miss? And I'll jot that down and add it in wherever I see fit. So yeah, podcasting is an interesting game. Yeah. And uh, I think if I had, con if, if 
today, if I was to do it with my best effort, I would properly prepare like you clearly have. And then I would follow my curiosity down a rabbit hole uh, because I know the audience probably has those same questions too. And I would pull the audience and mix their questions in. Yeah. Well, I don't want the audience to think that I'm kind of just going off of what you just said, but I did want to go down that route of trying to ask you a question. <laughs> like, So what would you say that anyone else hasn't asked already? But I'll, I'll frame it in a little different lens. I know based off of all the reading that I did that you actually had like a mastermind that you used to do with one of your friends. And one of the things that you would try to solve is that you saw that people were just asking the same questions over and over again. And that's kind of how you got the idea for, for book thinkers. And mm -hmm. similar to what it is now, I think it's interesting, like you said, that you're going to go on so many of these shows to promote the book. And I think it's awesome that you're going to get exposed to a lot of different audiences, but I know you're going to get asked a lot of the same questions over and over again. Art is so subjective, right? You're going to put something out and people are going to interpret it in a thousand different ways. I don't want you to say what your intention is for the book, but is there one central core theme that you think people might overlook reading the book upon first glance that you think, okay, when you come back to this book later on in life, maybe you come back to it five years from now, maybe you come back to it 10 years from now. Do you think there's something that people are going to get upon repeat reads like that? Yes. The importance of building an accountability group with your most motivated friends. Mm -hmm. It's a later part of the process. It's in the implementation section like you've talked about. I didn't expand on it as much as I think I wish I did. And I sort of wish that I put it earlier in the book so that people that only read a portion of the book uh, would get a little bit more of that. And here's why I say it. I started an accountability group with my friend, Joseph Gizzy is his last name. I call him Gizzy. He's mm -hmm. Joseph in the book. And uh, we met every single week and we talked about the books that we were reading and we talked about implementing them. And then my friend Tony joined and then a few more people joined. And each and every week, it was the call that I was most excited for because it was a bunch of young, motivated, progress seeking professionals who didn't know how to get where we wanted to go, but we knew yeah. we wanted to go somewhere. And like that, the camaraderie that you build with those people, the time that you spend, it's just so much fun. Yeah. And when I read a good book and I define a very specific action or intention, and I find those two things that I want to implement and I plug them into my activity tracker, who's holding me accountable to that? Well, my success buddies, my my accountability partners are. And that piece, you know, I think that I, I, I kind of wish that I expanded on it a little bit more. I think people are going to miss it. There's a Harvard study that has become super popular. It's one of the longest running studies on human behavior, I think, ever, and happiness and fulfillment. Yeah. And they're measuring uh, basically people from when they were young until they were old. I think it's got an 80-year study or something. And uh, they were looking for what variables in somebody's life can be correlated to happiness. Is it mm -hmm. money? Is it fame? What is it? And the answer was community. And so for me, building a community of like-minded people, you know, you are the average of the seven, five people you spend the most time with or whatever it is. Yeah. Like you want to rise with those people. You want to invite them on the journey up. You want to participate in it with each other. And it's yeah. so much more fulfilling that way because you have community and so good question. Kudos to you. And by the way, like you said, Book Thinkers was founded sort of in a mastermind group like that, mm -hmm. where Alec and I were showing up every weekend and whiteboarding all the problems and, and stuff like, you know. And by the way, yeah. here's a fun little tidbit for your audience. Yeah. It's not the first idea that we came up with that we took action on. Oh, we... Wow. <laughs> there was a, an entrepreneurship competition at UNH, University of New Hampshire. That's where we went. Yeah. And we submitted a proposal for a company called I Employ. I Employ. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that you could use an app uh, and hire college kids, local college kids, to come by and do miscellaneous tasks. It could be clean up your yard. It could be all sorts of things. And uh, at the time, services like TaskRabbit weren't as popular uh, there are other ways that you can get these things accomplished, but we wanted to create an Uber for odd jobs. You know, I need an able-bodied person to come by and do this. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it never ended up going anywhere, but we built out an entire proposal for it, submitted it, got a professor to sponsor it for us. We even uh, 
like built a fake version of the app. I had a videographer friend film some stuff for us. Never went anywhere, but book thinkers was item number two on that list. Do you think it was necessary to have that failure to get to book thinkers? Or do you think maybe, okay, you would have thought it through a little bit more. You would have had some other ideas and then you would have gotten to book thinkers still, or do you think that failure was kind of key? Yeah, tough to tell, but I'll just speak on failure for a second. I, yeah. I believe failure is the best teacher. Yeah. I think the U.S. education system has it wrong. Agreed. I think that we penalize failure and we incentivize this type of success where it's A's and B's or nothing. And uh, man, I hate that. Yeah. So there's a poem by Suli Brakes. He's a spoken word poet. I don't even know if he's active anymore, but years and years ago he was. And he had a poem called Why I Hate School But Love Education. And that sums me up, man. Like I I hate the traditional school system in that it teaches you to avoid failure at all costs. Otherwise, you'll be criticized like me dropping the bowl of popcorn in Spanish class. (laughs) Uh, Whereas it couldn't be further from the truth, man. Everything that book thinkers is today is a result of every failure I've made. Yeah. Some of them aren't so obvious. Like maybe I think we still would have gotten to book thinkers without having failed at I employ, but every little failure that I've had has made me a tougher human being that's more resilient. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it, it definitely helped in some way, shape or form. Yeah. From, an, from an outside observer's perspective, I can just tell that you're just all in, which is something that I admire so much. And I mean that in the business sense. And I mean that in a personal sense. When you talk about having accountability groups with your friends, I don't know a whole lot of people that are doing that. And when it comes to developing like a solid relationship with a core group of people, that's going all in to make sure that the people around you are living the best that they can. I mean, that's amazing. And there's no one that I know that is taking the time out of their day to read hundreds upon hundreds of books, go to the authors, pitch them out to other podcasts, help them build up their audience so they can succeed. You're all in on so many facets of life, which to me is just inspiring to me. And when I think about defining success, and that's what this whole show is about, how young people can define success for themselves, it's exactly like you talk about. You're all in on so many things and you're enjoying the passage of time. You're not doing something that you don't enjoy. You're being all in and you're being present every single day. And I want to transition this to another facet of your life that just recently happened. Um, and it starts New Year's Eve at Ned Devine's. <laughs> you, oh, would you watch that whole wedding video? Of course I did. I, I, have, I, to do my, I have to do my homework. Um, but you go there and you meet Rachel. And now you're, you're happily married. And congratulations, this recently just happened. Thank you. Yes. I'm sure when you walked in to Ned Devine's that day, you weren't thinking, wow, I'm going to meet my wife today. Maybe you were. I don't know. but (laughs) No, I wasn't. Yeah. In fact, the exact opposite. Yeah. (laughs) I I have that mentality sometimes too. When I go out, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to happen today. I just have this feeling. And then, uh, you know, you never know what happens. And clearly (laughs) you you didn't know what was going to happen. But just talking about being present with Rachel, being all in when it comes to a relationship, especially now with marriage, how are you able to be all in. You have so many things going on in your life and so many people at this age will say, I just don't have time for relationship, even though it is a fundamental truth of who we are as people, that we need love. And yet we're so willing to deny it nowadays. So how are you able to be all in with Rachel in every in every aspect of life? Yeah, it's a great question that nobody's asked me about before on a podcast. Jordan Peterson, one of my favorite authors, philosophers, he's kind of aggressive for some people. But one of his lessons is have the fight. If something in your relationship uh, doesn't meet a certain standard or starts to slip, talk Mm -hmm. about it. I saw Jay Shetty post something the other day, and he said that something like 80% of most couples' interactions happen while watching Netflix. Like, that's not an activity. (laughs) How? What? Your entire relationship is built around watching Netflix silently while you sit next to each other? Um, so yeah, I think have the fight, have the conversation, build, be transparent, talk to each other, um, grow with each other, be each other's accountability partners. You know, one of my favorite things to do with Rachel and one of my favorite reasons for why I think we have a successful relationship is international travel. Yeah. Rachel and I 
after the Ned Devine's night, we kind of went separate ways for a little while, reconnected. And within a couple of months, we were traveling internationally together. And what that does is it forces two people to be in the same space and to go through difficult anxiety ridden situations like airports and yeah. Ubers and taxis and checking into hotels and carrying luggage upstairs and uh, trying to communicate in languages that you don't speak and ordering new foods and using currencies that you don't know the exchange rate for. It sort of condensed everything that could happen in 10 years into a few months. And by the end of that few months, we knew whether or not we liked each other <laughs> and, uh, and have the fight, have the conversation. Don't be a pushover. Yeah. I'll get the math wrong. Maybe we could do it out loud real quick. But Jordan Peterson says something like, if something annoys you and it happens three times a day, over a 10-year period, it will happen 30,000 times or something like that. Yeah. Or if it happens once a day for 30 years, it happens 10,000 times, whatever the math is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a lot of inconveniences yeah. to be silent about. Have the fight, have the conversation, be constructive, work with each other. Yeah. And that's what we try to do. I'm, one time we were driving, we are on a long car ride and we listened to the book, The Five Love Languages. And we had conversations with each other about the love languages. You know, we've read all sorts of books together and listened to all sorts of books together and had constructive, real conversations about it. Yeah. And that's the type of thing that you don't see most couples doing. And, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's how I've been able, but let me answer one different thing real quick. Yeah. How do I remain present? Something that number one, travel creates presence. Novelty creates presence. If you want to be shoved into the present moment, experience something new. Yeah. And so I think while we travel together, I've built a business. I'm still a little bit of a bottleneck, but I've automated, delegated, or eliminated most everything as far mm -hmm. as responsibilities go. And so I can be present for an entire month without being consumed by work. Yeah. And uh, that helps a lot. And then we're struggling with this a little bit right now because I have a book coming out. I have an event coming up. I have a business that's growing. We're hiring more people. Yeah. Uh, and, and we just got married and we just had a honeymoon. <laughs> But uh, yeah, shutting the computer down after a certain period of time and just saying, I'm not working anymore. Yeah. And I have all these app limits set up on my phone. So I don't get emails. I don't get notifications from any social platforms or anything like that after 6 p.m. And I think that also helps create some presence as well. That's awesome. I think there's a lot of takeaways for people there. And Oh, and get a dog. Get a dog. <laughs> so you are get pro a dog. dog. I have this debate yes. all the time with my roommates. So I, I live with three other guys and we debate all the time. Like if we get a dog right now, who's taking care of it? <laughs> because we can't even take care of the apartment. But <laughs> well, that's a good point. I'll, I'll just say as far as presence goes, when you're walking a dog with somebody else, like that's a great excuse to get out of the house and do something different. You're going to bump into other people. You're going to have funny situations happen. And yeah. uh, the dog is always a good subject of conversation if you run out of things to talk about. <laughs> That's very true. And I, I find it so fascinating, the lifestyle that you and Rachel have. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with the term who's listening, a digital nomad can be used to describe the type of lifestyle that you have. And that's used to talk about anybody who's able to work from multiple countries at any one point throughout the year and is able to stay there for a certain amount of time. So you're not just vacationing, you're actually traveling and you get to immerse yourself in the culture. And I think it's so fascinating that you talk about, you listen to the five love languages, but you're also in other countries that have different expressions of love and what it means to be present with somebody, what it means to, to show affection to somebody. Is there anything that you've picked up amongst your travels that you've seen and you're like, wow, I didn't realize that this is how love is defined in this country. And it's something that you've implemented into your relationship. Hmm. I don't know. That's a really good question. I'm sure that something has happened subconsciously. Yeah. Has anything happened consciously that we've talked about? You know, I'll make a broad statement first as I continue to search on mm -hmm. multitask. Yeah. The broad statement is that in most of the Central and South American countries that we've traveled to, family, a family first mentality is more obvious. Yeah. People live with their families longer. They spend more time with their families. They don't hire babysitters because the grandmothers take care of the grandkids. Like a family unit means so much more in a lot of the countries that we've traveled to. And that has translated into our thinking. Yeah. 
Yeah. I wanted to move to Florida. We live in the Boston, Massachusetts area. I wanted to move to Florida uh, from the moment I met Rachel. And we agreed to move to Florida once we got married. And we got married and she said, hey, the family unit means more than anything to me right now. If we have kids in the next couple of years, I don't want to hire a babysitter. I want our grandparent, you know, their grandparents to take care of them. Yeah. And I want to be close to family and be able to re rely on them. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow because I don't love Massachusetts, but I do love my family. And I, I'm jealous of, of how other countries treat family as a unit. And so that's something that we're, we have implemented into our relationship, I suppose, yeah. um, in the relationship that we have with our family. And so, yeah, it's something that I really admire. Like you'll meet somebody in their thirties who's single and they live with their parents still. Yeah. And it's because that's just what you do. And it's not embarrassing and it's not weird to talk about. It's healthy yeah. in most of those countries. And it's, uh, I think it's a beautiful way of living. Yeah. I, I agree. And I'm in, I'm in New York right now. So I live in the city half the time. The other half the time, I'm at my parents' house in Westchester because it's just easier. Right now, I'm in my childhood bedroom coming to you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's just the quietest <laughs> place I have. When, when we hang up, I'm going to family dinner with my grandparents because it's what I value. I try to make time. And I know that a lot of people do. And I know it's not this non-existent thing in our, in our culture, but it's definitely something that's not emphasized enough, in my opinion, where we don't have gratitude, I think, for the time that we have with our family. And oh, I can't remember who said this. I feel so bad. But I, I've heard someone say before that, you know, when you get older, you think about, oh, I have X amount of years left with my father. Let's say five. But Jesse only, Itzler. Thank yeah, you so said. much. Thank you so much. And like he said, you only have two visits per year with your father. That only means you have 10 times left with your father. Like even when you put it in that perspective, it kind of changes everything and it kind of changes your whole world. And for me, I'd want to maximize the time that I have left with my family. And I want to make sure that those um, visits are numerous and gratitude, especially when it comes to young people, like we struggle with it so much. And I, I've heard you talk about how you do the, the one minute recap for gratitude that you have 52 weeks a year. And you're going to have this massive conglomeration of videos to show what you've been grateful for throughout the time. And this new phase of life, where you're entering into marriage, like you just said, you're moving away from your family. How important is it to you to have that form of gratitude, that sign that's tangible and you can view it multiple times. You can look at it anytime that you need to. And if it's getting hard, if you're in this period right now where you're getting ready to put out the book, it's going to be really stressful. There's going to be a lot of people pulling at you in different directions, but you're able to stay grounded just because you have something that you've produced and you can see what you've been grateful for. How does that impact you on your day to day? Yeah, gratitude means everything to me. So when I first started practicing gratitude, I would journal three things that I was grateful for every day mm -hmm. on a yellow pad, a piece of paper, whatever, in a gratitude journal. And then eventually I got the numbers one, two, three tattooed on my wrist as a daily reminder to be grateful. And whenever I would meet a stranger and they would talk about my tattoos, I would bring this up and then I'd ask them three things they're grateful for. So we'll pause real quick. Tom, yeah. three things that you're grateful for. What are they? This conversation today, um, and just having met you in general, for the people who don't know, Nick and I have been collaborating for a couple months now. He's been so influential uh, to helping me get authors on this podcast, or just helping this podcast grow. And I can't thank you enough for this relationship. I'm thankful for my relationship with God. I feel very strong today. I feel like he's present and he's just listening to this conversation and keeping me going. Um, and I'm grateful that I get to do this today. And what I mean by that is I just get to wake up today and I get to be present and I get to have this type of conversation as opposed to waking up not feeling like I even want to be here today. I know a lot of people can't say that, so I feel really grateful. And now I'm going to pass it on to you. What are you grateful for today? Well, we have a gratitude group chat in our, uh, for book thinkers. And so I'll read you the three things that I wrote for today rather than make them up on the spot and I'll, I'll articulate them. So today I wrote... <laughs> <laughs> today I wrote number one, a great back and by workout. Nice. So <laughs> I got to the gym about 20 minutes earlier today than I normally do. And so I just decided to crush an extra 20 minutes. And, uh, so I'm also feeling strong today. Um, number two, I wrote Rachel Hutchison, my wife. <laughs> and that's just because, you know, we had a great conversation this morning, great conversation last night. And, uh, 
yeah, so I was just enjoying her presence. And then number three, I wrote podcasting because I've been on a number of podcasts recently. I've also hosted a ton of podcasts recently, um, kind of creating a backlog for shows that will come out for the rest of the year. Nice. And so I'm also grateful for that. And uh, I'm grateful for you in this conversation, of course. Thank you. I'm marinating a whole thing of beef jerky that I'll dehydrate <laughs> tomorrow. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my dog Pickles right before this call. I had 15 minutes, so I ran down and played with him in the backyard for a few minutes, and nice. he's the man, big dog guy. And uh, so those are some things that I'm grateful for. I also have this ta ta uh, <laughs> sorry, this tattoo on the back of my wrist, which says agradecido, which is gratitude in Spanish. And uh, I just, I love these tattoos as reminders. So to get back to your question, as I started to tattoo gratitude onto my body, I read a book called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins. Mm -hmm. And in Die With Zero, he talks about memory, the concept of memory dividends. And so if you invest in something that will pay, like an investment vehicle that will pay dividends, that means you're going to get additional things out over time. Yeah. And so same thing with memories. You invest in an experience, you have that initial experience, and as you relive the memory, you can feel the joy or the gratitude again and again and again. And it might even compound into something different because when I tell you about this experience, I spill the milk or whatever, and now it becomes this other story and they can grow in fun in different ways. Yeah. So I thought about that, I think. And he has a story in the book where he talks about his dad is aging. He went back, found his dad's old football like highlights and stuff and a bunch of other family memories, put them all on an iPad so his dad could revisit them. And so I had Die With Zero and that story, the idea of dividends stuck in my head. And I had this daily practice of gratitude. And I thought, let's merge them together and create a gratitude time capsule. So each and every day, I journal the things that I'm grateful for. And then once a week, I pull out my phone in selfie mode, and I'll just talk to the camera for up to a minute. And I'll save that in a Google Drive folder for each year. And uh, in the future, what I'd like to do is consolidate each year into 52 minutes of gratitude and be able to watch an entire year's worth of highlights. And so I think the value of that, I mean, it can come at any point in my life, but I think when I'm older and uh, I'm starting to, yeah, starting to lose my mental facilities, <laughs> I'll be able to go back and, and relive so many amazing years of my life and go through the highlight reels. Like, how cool is that? Why, why isn't everybody doing that? It literally takes one minute per week to do that. I, I was just going to say, I think I'm, I'm going to have to steal it from you because I don't do that. Yeah, go and ahead. Then, thank you. I, <laughs> it, it's so true. It's so easy. And we're constantly on our phones. There's always like the memes of people on their phones when they're at a show, they're at a, at a ball game or something. And they're filling all these moments that they'll never take a look at. But all you got to do is just turn the phone around for a second. It's so simple. And, and same with tattoos. I, I don't have any tattoos. I've always flirted with the idea of getting them. Yet. Um, I think I'm going to. I, I'm going to cave in one day. Um, and I, I've heard you talk about your tattoos before. And you just looking at you through the camera, here, you have a really nice sleeve going on. Like, that's goals. <laughs> um, <laughs> one that I've never heard you talk about. And I just wanted to bring up, if, if you're comfortable with it. Um, I can do all, all of them. Oh, thank you. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, Philippians 4.13. I think you got that right on right on the bicep. Why that one? I, I mean, it's to me, it speaks to me. But to anyone who might not understand the context of that verse, what it means, why did you why did that stick out to you? And why did you, why do you feel the need to put it on your body to see it? And when we talk about like retention, see it every day and you can remember, okay, this really stuck with me. It's a great question. I'm going to give you sort of a cheap answer because it's kind of a cheap story. Mm -hmm. um, there was a period of time where I was getting tattooed and I told each one of my brothers, I have three brothers. I said, you guys pick out a tattoo. I want a matching tattoo with each of you to sort of further this idea of family first. I want to share in what's meaningful to them. Yeah. And so my brother Chandler, who does work for Book Thinkers full time, decided he wanted the Phil 413 tattoo. And so... I decided to get the full thing written out. He decided just to get, you know, the abbreviated version and the verse. Um, but what does the tattoo mean to me? Well, originally I got it for my brother and because it was really meaningful to him at the time. I think that 
as I've grown and as I'm constantly reminded of the tattoo, it just reinforces the feeling that I can do anything and that God does support me, that he does flow through me, that when I'm making decisions, it's a collaboration, that when I'm acting, it's as a group, you know, it's, it's yeah. with reinforcements and it just brings more confidence to the table. I recently started going to church again. I'm a Catholic mm -hmm. and I've been to mass now three weeks in a row with my mom and I really enjoy being at church. I enjoy participating in mass. I've always continued my practices of praying in the morning and praying in the evening, but I fell out of routine with, with church. Mm -hmm. So I'm back in there, but yeah, I love Bible verses. I think it's, you know, if I was stuck on an Island for a year or something <laughs> like that, and I could only bring one book, it would be the Bible. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's just so much wisdom in there, Absolutely. but hopefully that wasn't too cheap of an answer for you. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I, and the reason I asked if you're comfortable with it is because I know so many people will get tattoos and they'll say, you know, it's just personal. I've, I've heard that a lot of times. And I'm mm. very glad that you've been so open and honest with me today and with everyone else who might be listening. Um, it's been an awesome conversation. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day. For anyone who doesn't know, which is everyone, uh, it's currently 6 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> Nick took the time out of his day to do this. So I can't be more thankful. Last question. It's the show staple question that I'm going to ask everybody going forward. And we've covered a lot of different topics today. And this is an open-ended question. After everything you've been through so far, and hopefully many more amazing experiences, what have you learned about love? I think so far, I've realized that the feeling, the emotion is fleeting, it's temporary, but the relationship that you have with somebody else, that's a decision that you have to make and you have to consistently invest in and participate in. Mm -hmm. So I've just realized that uh, yeah, relationships take work, whether it's the love of yourself the love of your romantic partner, the love of your family, whatever the case may be, those relationships take work and you have to invest in them. And it's an ongoing relationship and it's two-sided unless it's with yourself. I suppose that might be two-sided too, <laughs> um, with God, whatever the case may be. And uh, it's a decision you have to make. I want to love this person. I want to invest my time consistently. And it's an ongoing thing. So yeah, that's that's what I think I've learned so far. 